Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We welcome members and visitors alike. May God bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to many, many people. And I hope that you'll call somebody on the phone out there in the radio listen audience and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. Now, I'm speaking today on this subject, the gates of Jerusalem or the Jerusalem gates. The Jerusalem Gates, it'll be tape number 292. If you'd like to have the message and the singing and music on cassette tape, you can write in and get it for $3. And the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, and get the daily broadcast. But if you're writing to get these tape and play them, then it'll be a blessing to you. Maybe play them for shut-ins. And I hope that I'll hear from you next week. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. I'm taking a look at Nehemiah, and it's page 542 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Many times people ask me about the Schofield Reference Bible. I'm partial toward that one because it can be very helpful in many ways. I have a few in my study. I get a few along to help my members out. I can let them have it at maybe a 10 or 12 or $15 discount, cheaper than you could buy them elsewhere. And I have a few on hand. That's the original Schofield Reference Bible. If you'd like to write in and get a list of our cassette tape, we have some 286 messages listed on the list. You can choose the message you want and write in and get the tape by title or by number. I'd like for you to write in and get our Holy Land brochure. We're planning trip number 14 to the Holy Land in March of next year. We plan to go to Israel for eight days and England for two days. We plan to fly from Atlanta on Swiss Air, which is one of the most safe airlines you'll find today. And we're looking forward to it. If you're interested in this trip, write in and get a brochure. If you're listening in the radio listen audience and your pastor's never been, one of the greatest things you can do for him is send him as a church or as a group or as a friend. My mailing address once again is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now, if God lets me live and remain on the radio another week or so, I, that will uh, complete 39 years of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. We went on the air on September the 1st, 1948. We've been on daily since that time, and we'll complete 39 years. We thank God for this radio ministry. A lot of people in heaven today that's had a part in it. A lot of people in heaven because of it. They heard the gospel. They were saved. Churches have been established. Missionaries on the field. Many things have taken place because of this 39 years of gospel preaching from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. I thank God for the open door. I'm glad we can be a blessing to you. Many people say to me, Preach Edwards, my parents, even in their old days, listen to you until they went on home to be with the Lord. There's great comfort to them. And I thank God that we can be a blessing to God's people. Now, I'm not going to read this entire chapter of Nehemiah. That's chapter 3 because... It take about all my time reading the chapter. I'm going to pick out some of these gates and make mention of them. In Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1, you have the sheep gate. You have in verse 3 the fish gate. 
You have in verse 6 the old gate. You have in verse 13 the valley gate. You have in verse 14 the dung gate. You have in verse 15 the gate of the fountain. Then you have in verse 26 the water gate. You have in verse 28 the horse gate. And then in verse 29 the east gate. And then you have in verse 31 the Mifkad gate. I want to comment on these different gates. In olden times, yonder in the Middle East, when they build a city, they, of course, would put gates in the walls of those cities. And they had towers on top of the walls in order to watch out for the enemy. Didn't have communication like we have today, of course. And they had to build those towers and build those gates to protect their cities. Now, Nehemiah was under a great burden because the gates had been torn down in Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar had gone in and took captive the Israelites and brought them into Babylon. And so Nehemiah is very much burdened about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And he received permission from the ruler to go back and rebuild those walls. And so he went back to labor and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the gates thereof. Now in Psalms chapter 24 and verse 7, it says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be ye lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Now kind of remember that as a text. Now I want to comment briefly on each one of these gates, and it will be briefly because there's several. And I want to take a look at them. I believe that we can find something about these gates that will help us today as a child of God, something typical, something very important. Now, if you notice, first of all, he mentioned the sheep gate in verse 1. And to build the sheep gate and to sanctify it and set the doors of it. Now, you know about a sheep. Now, a sheep in the Bible is a type of a child of God. The Bible says in, in Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 7, talking about Jesus, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her share is dumb, so open not his mouth. In Psalms chapter 79, verse 13, So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever and will show forth thy praises to all generation. And Jesus said he was a good shepherd that leads the sheep in John 10, 14. But the sheep gate here was built near the temple. It's why the sheep is brought in to be offered on the altar. And so before you can go to heaven, you must become a sheep or a child of God. A sheep is a type of a saved person. A goat is a type of the unsaved person. And Jesus is the great shepherd. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God, talking about Jesus, that taketh away the sin of the world. And you find also it says next to them build the men of Jericho. And Jericho, of course, reminds us of a curse. God placed a curse on Jericho. So Christ bore our cross and the curse of sin. He said, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So in order for you to become a sheep of his pasture, you must come to know him as your Savior. And he was made a curse for us. He was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And they crucified him on a cruel Roman cross. And there we have the shepherd dying that the sheep might be saved. That is, that God's people might get to heaven. That we might be born again by the precious blood of the word of God, by the precious word and the spirit of God brought about by the precious blood. And so we see the sheep gate. That means if you go to heaven... You'll have to come in, as it were, through the sheep gate. And Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. And he said, I'm the only way in. I am the way, he said. And so you must come through the sheep gate and then that way enter in to the family of God. By one spirit, you baptize into the body of Christ. So you either in or out. You're part of the fold or you're not. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. If you've been saved, you're sheep. If you're still lost, you're still a goat. So you must remember that. But the moment you get saved, you're recognized as a sheep of his pasture. And keep that in mind. He is the good shepherd. 
And that leads us to gate number two, which is the fish gate in verse three. The Bible said the fish gate and the son of Hassan are built. Now the fish gate reminds us of something in the Bible. It reminds us of soul winning. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishes of men. And so we need to follow the Lord, and He'll make us soul winners, make us fishes of men. A lot of people like to fish. I'm reminded of these two, um, uh, their old black fellows went fishing one day, and, and one of them decided to take his rifle along because he saw some snakes occasionally whenever they went fishing these two fellows went fishing and the man that had the rifle got down below a bush and started fishing the other man is up above a bush they're fishing it's kind of hot and so the man above the bush pulled off his shoes and stuck his big feet in the water and his big toe was sticking out out there in the water the man below the bush saw that big toe and thought it was a turtle head sticking up and he said to the man above the bush he said I see a turtle sticking his head up out there and the man said shoot him so he took good aim and shot and shot the man's toe off the man said shoot him again he's done bit my toe off so a lot of times you can't ever tell what you might be shooting at and but anyway they went fishing that's the point you know a lot of people like to fish and know how to go out and catch fish and and I like to eat fish, I really do. But anyway, Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you a fish of men. In Proverbs chapter 11, the Bible tells us in verse 30, He that winneth souls is wise, and it's not a one of us what can't be a soul winner. I don't care how young or old you may be, you can be a winner of souls to Jesus Christ. I, I know the Bible tells us you can bring forth fruit in old age. Many years ago, there's a great evangelist at that time, which was shooting straight down the line, preaching the gospel, not supporting modernism or liberalism in those days. He came to it a year from Atlanta and put up a tent in Athens. His name was Jesse Henley. Many of you know him and heard of him. And he won people to God by the hundreds. Great numbers of people saved. Two big boys from the University of Georgia, football players, attended the meeting. And, and he was given an invitation one night, and a little old lady that could hardly walk. She had to use a walking stick to move along, and she felt a burden for those big boys back there, big old football players. And so she hobbled back doing the invitation. She stood in front of him, just a little old bent-over woman, uh, very aged, and she said to those boys, said, boys, are you saved? They said, no, we're not saved. She said, you ought to get saved. If you're not saved, you die like that, you're going to hell, and you ought to get saved tonight. They said, oh, Ma, go on, let us alone. We're all right. Go on back down and sit down. And, but she kept on begging them to come to Jesus and talking to them, but they didn't come. Those boys went back to the dormitory that night, and long about 3 o'clock in the morning, one said, the other, you haven't gone to sleep yet? He said, no, I haven't. You haven't slept any? He hadn't slept a week. So why haven't she gone to sleep? He said, I can't get that old woman off my mind. Said she kind of bugged me and she told me the truth and said, if she's telling the truth, we may be in hell before we realize. The other boy said, I was thinking about the same thing and I can't sleep either. And so those two big old boys got down on their knees and gave their hearts to God and went back to the meeting telling people that Jesus had saved them. Now, what are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you, that that dear old woman, feeble, could hardly walk, was a great soul winner and won those big boys to God. I can tell you about how children won children to God and children won parents to God. Now God wants us to be a fish of men. Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 35, Look on the fields, for they're white already for harvest. There's many, many souls to be won. There's more people in the world today ever been before, some five billion on the face of this earth, and most of them on the road to hell. Very few out of the five billion, beloved, that's saved today. Lost, many of them religious, but on the road to hell. That moves us to gate number three, and I must hurry along. Gate number three was the old gate. 
The Bible says in verse 6, the old gate was repaired by Jehodiah, the son of Bersir, and there they repaired the old gate. Now the old gate reminds us of the old-fashioned way. Now I'm an old-fashioned, fundamental, independent, Bible-believing, missionary, Baptist, and I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I believe in the old way. I believe in worshiping God in the old way. I believe we need to serve God in the old-fashioned way. Someone told me the other day about a couple who came in here one Sunday night, and we usually pray on Sunday night, a few of us, before we, when the choir goes down. We've been doing this for 30 years. If you remain here at the altar, and we just have prayer, and sometimes we several of us praying at the same time. Nothing wrong in that. My God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and he can hear millions all over the world. I don't care, I don't care where they are. I'm not ashamed to pray in unison. And we prayed, and this young couple uh, got up and left. They said they told someone they thought he's in a charismatic church. See, they don't know what it's all about. They didn't wait to hear the preacher. They didn't wait to find out whether he preached the word or not. They, they misjudged us. And we've been praying in unison for 30 years, and we'll continue to do so, whether people like it or not. People ought to learn some sense and find out a few things before they misjudge somebody. We are not charismatic. We are fundamental Bible-believing Christians and love God. We're not in the movement building a one-world church and lining up with all religions in the world. I believe in the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way. Worship God in the old-fashioned I believe in the old-fashioned Bible. You cannot improve upon this good old King James Version. There's not a better translation in the land. You'd do, do well to stick by it, away with these modern liberal translations, throw them in the garbage can, and get you a real good old-fashioned fundamental King James Version 1611 Bible and read that thing and stick with it. Have nothing to do with these modern translations. And so the old gate reminds us of the old-fashioned way. Now, if you don't like the old-fashioned way, you'd be out of place here at Northside. You better go join some of these up up the up treetop society churches and not join Northside. We're old-fashioned, and we always will be old-fashioned. I believe in it with all my heart. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We'd be crazy to try to change the word of God. It's forever settled in heaven. God gave us this book. And we better stick by the book. And it's forever settled in heaven. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, ye shall find the rest for your souls. Now the Bible said, find the old paths, wherein is the good way. We have a dear man sitting in the audience today. He came out of one of the other churches in town, and made a statement as he went out one day. He said, man, it's, it's good to breathe some good fresh air. Well, I knew what he meant. Beloved, we believe in the good old-fashioned way. Good old country-type church that loves God, and if you don't believe in the Bible in the old way, then you'd be out of place here at Northside, and we'll never change as long as I'm pastor. And I don't think we'd ever change if I ever left because we got some men here that's founded and women that's founded in the Word, they're not going to change. They're going to stick by the book till Jesus comes. Then we find gate number four, which is the valley gate. The Bible said in verse 13, the valley gate repaired Hanan, and they repaired the valley gate. Now there is a time when you're going through a valley. You may have not gone through one yet. You may have just gone through one. You may have gone through one in the past, but you may go through one in the future. But you must remember when you go through the valley that Jesus is the lily of the valley. And don't you worry about it because he'll see you through the valley. And there'll come a time when you'll travel through a valley, but the mountaintop will be sweet when you get back on the mountain. In Psalms chapter 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel evil. Thou art with me, thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now when you go through a valley... You appreciate the mountaintop that much the more. A lot of people have an idea when they get saved that everything will be honey, sugar, and roses, but it won't be. 
You'll have battles. You'll have to fight the enemy. You'll have temptations. You'll have various things to come and try to hinder you. And as you go through the valley, remember there's a, there's a mountaintop out there that you're going to reach and just keep pressing on. And Jesus will be with you as you go through the valley. I may be speaking to someone today out in the radio listening audience. And right now, you, you're going through a testing time. You, you're going through a valley. And uh, you're kind of depressed. And, and you wonder what's going to happen. And you're having a valley experience. Let me say to you, Jesus is the lady of the valley. You just keep on moving on with faith in God. Stay on your knees and in the book. One of these days, you'll come to the mountaintop. And that will be much sweeter after you pass through that valley. But you need to remember there's a time coming when you may go through that valley. And remember what this preacher is telling you when you do. That's the valley gate. Number five is the refuge gate of the dung gate. Verse 14. The Bible says, but the dung gate repaired Melchiah. Now this is the gate out of which the garbage and filth of the city was taken at night. At night time, they'd open up this particular gate. And out of the city of Jerusalem, they would carry the garbage and the filth and everything that they wanted to dispose of and take it down to the, the place where they burned it. And they'd go out this valley, this Adung gate, to do so and carry it out and empty it out and come back in and lock the gate. Now, there's some things that you need to get out of your life. There's some things you need to carry out this particular gate and bury it and forget about it and serve God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises dear of love, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God wants you to take out the dung gate, everything that holds you back and hinders you, your bad habits and bad things you do and things that's not right, move her out that gate and throw her out there on the dump heap and where it'll be burned as it were. And you need to do that to the glory of God. Many of God's children need to go out the dung gate once in a while because you let too much garbage accumulate in your life, too many things that hinder you, and if you don't get rid of it, it's going to really pull you down spiritually. Take a trip out that gate, that refuge gate once in a while, and get rid and dispose of those things that hinder you. Some of you could carry them old cool lucky camel fields you got in your shirt pocket out there and dump them down there where they could be burned. Some of you carry that old uh, tobacco, that old scroll. Oh, I, I see young boys walking around where they carry a scroll box in the hip pockets long. It's uh, just about wore through their pockets. And you see the, see the roundness of it on, a, on their hip pocket, and you know immediately they're snuff dippers. Every time I see the print on a boy's pocket, I think, man, you sissy, you ought to quit dipping snuff. My grandmother used to dip snuff years ago. I always thought, I thought snuff is made for women. Uh, but it really shouldn't be made for anybody. But you got young boys today that dip that stuff. And they're carried around in that little old metal pouch in their back pocket till they wear a hole in their pocket and dip that stuff and rot their teeth out. And some of them come up with lung cancer and, and uh, mouth cancer and all that kind of stuff. Carried out the dung gate, throw it down there, the rest of the junk, and forget about it. That old plug of brown mule. I don't know whether make brown mule anymore or not. They used to when I was a boy. But any of that stuff that defiles your body, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And things that pull you down and hinder you, get rid of them, carry them out the refuge gate and dump them out down there where they can be burned and destroyed. A little girl asked her mother one time what made the flowers grow. And before her mother could answer, she said, I guess they just get up out of the dirt. That's the way flowers grow, just get up out of the dirt. Now, if you get up out of the dirt, you'll grow. You'll grow spiritually, become strong in the Lord, but if you stay down in the dirt with the red worms and everything is down in the ground, you're not going to grow. Come up out of the dirt and, and serve God and grow. Paul said, I count all things but dung that, that I might win Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, Paul said, I forget all everything of the past that hinders me out this dung gate they go, and I'm going to serve God. And he did. 
Gate number six we find to be the, the fountain gate in verse 15. But the gate of the fountain gate repaired Shalom. Now the fountain gate here reminds us of God's great fountain from which we drink. The Bible says in John chapter 4 and verse 14, But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in the everlasting life. You ought to be drinking from God's fountain every day, from the word of God. John chapter 7 and verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. God wants you to be filled with the Spirit and flowing out and God drinking from God's fountain. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13 that the people hewn out their own cisterns. Cisterns wouldn't hold water. They put water in cisterns and caught them in water in those days, rain water. But they had hewed out cisterns of their own and had cracks in them. And that's the way it is a lot of church members. You've got cracks in your cistern and, and you don't hold the things of God. You hear it and it goes in one ear and out the other. And you don't maintain the things you ought to because you've hewn out cisterns and they won't hold water. Get back to God's fountain. Then number seven, you have the water gate. And when I said water gate, I didn't say something about Nixon here, but the Bible says there's a water gate. In verse 26, moreover, the, the Nephilims dwelt in Ophel on the place over against the water gate. And it makes no mention here of the repair. The reason it makes no mention of the repair is it's a symbol of God's word. The water gate here is a symbol of the word of God, and it didn't need any repair. Now, you can't repair the word of God. The Word of God needs no repair. Somebody said to me one time, I think we need to write a new Bible. That is old and running out. No, no. You don't repair the Word of God. And they didn't repair the water gate because it didn't need it. And you don't repair this book. This book is the same and always stand. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not this book. She's going to stand. Now Ezra had his pulpit right near the water gate. Ezra, the great preacher that went in there, put his pulpit right next to the water gate because the water gate is a symbol of the Word of God. And a man that has a pulpit and doesn't have the blessed Word of God is in bad shape. A lot of preachers go in that little old um, modern translation, good news for modern man, and, and the, you know, the all kind of uh, modern translations and walk up in the pulpit. They don't have the real pure Word of God. Now, the Bible tells us Ezra had his pulpit there because it speaks of the pure word, the word of God, the Bible. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 3, Now you're clean through the word I've spoken unto you. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible, verses 26 and 27, speaks of the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is God's cleansing power and authority. God will use this book to clean you up. When you look in this mirror and see what you need, get on your knees, God cleans you up. This is God's mirror, God's hammer, God's word, God's fire. And it burns up the draws and it breaks to pieces. And that God uses his word for that purpose. You can't ignore the word of God and play lightly with this book and expect to be a, a strong Christian or a strong church. You just can't do it. And so there we have the water gate, no repairing. The word of God needs no repairing. Number eight, you have the horse gate in verse 28. The Bible says, from above the horse gate repaired the priest, everyone over against his horse, house. rather. Now the horse gate speaks of warfare. Through this gate, the army went to battle. Through this gate, David reviewed his troops, the horse gate. Now God wants us to have some power. We have the word. We have the most highly educated ministry today we've ever had and less power with God. The Bible said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now God wants us to have power in our preaching, in our teaching, in our witnessing, in our everyday living. Charles G. Finney had so much power of the Holy Ghost on him until everybody he spoke to came to know Jesus. If it didn't right then, they would later as a result of it. They couldn't get away from it like sticking a dagger in their hearts. That man had such power with God until people fall on the conviction when he's just walking around and talking about the things of God. We need power. We're living a little firecracker life in an atomic age when we need power with God. 
And every individual can have that power with God Almighty used for God's glory. The Bible says in Job chapter 39 and verse 19, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? That horse gate speaks of power. We need to hang around the horse gate once in a while. Get a little power in our services. Gate number nine is the east gate. In verse 29, the keeper of the east gate. Now the east gate was the first gate open in the morning. And when the night had passed and day had come, light came in. That was the first gate open every morning, that east gate. Now that east gate reminds us of the bright and morning star when she begins to shine. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shines even on the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That east gate reminds us of the coming of our dear Lord. We need to be kind of watching around at the east gate because the morning star might appear at any time. And the east gate is where he's coming, so to speak. Now, I was in uh, Jerusalem some time ago, and a gang of uh, young Jewish boys dancing out there under a vineyard. And they were going around and around and saying something I couldn't understand. I said to the guide, what are they saying? They're saying, glory, hallelujah, the Messiah cometh from the east. Glory, hallelujah, the Messiah cometh from the east. That's what they were saying. They're still looking for the Messiah to come. So it wouldn't hurt you to hang around the east gate a while. Then we come to the final gate, and that's the gate Mifkad. In verse 31, over against the gate Mifkad, and it's a place of review. David received his troops after battle at the gate Mifkad. Now when those troops would go out and come back in after battle, there they met the king. Now the Mifkad gate speaks of judgment. It's appointed a man wants to die, and after that, the Mifkad gate. You're going to die one of these days to be raptured out, and after that comes the Mifkad gate. You're going to stand before Jesus that the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to how you came out in the battle. You're a soldier in the army of God, and you're in a battle down here, and the king is going to review you when you come in. He's going to review his troops and find out how well we did in battle down here on the earth. Every one of us must go to the Mifkad gate. So we started here at the sheep gate, went all the way around Jerusalem and came back to the ship, uh, the, the um, uh, sheep gate there at the Mifkad gate. So we made a circle and saw all the gates. And I wonder today, are you familiar with these gates? If not, then you ought to be. I trust God will use the message to help you. Go in at the sheep gate, come out at the Mifkad gate at the judgment seat of Christ. Start with Jesus, end up with Jesus. That's the way it is for the Christian journey. Let's stand to our feet.